Welcome to the Elephant Tales podcast from Wildlife SOS, where we bring you the intimate stories and behind-the-scenes perspectives with the people working to save India's wildlife. Please be sure to sign up for our email news updates at wildlifesos.org slash subscribe. Hi, I'm Dana Wilson, Director of Marketing Communications for Wildlife SOS USA. If you're an avid bear fan, today we'll catch up with Thomas Sharp about our research into wild sloth bear populations and learn more about sloth bears. Tom is a director of conservation and research for Wildlife SOS, specializing in sloth bears, Asian elephants, and leopards in India. With 25 years of experience studying wildlife around the globe, Tom has worked with many species from turtle snakes and crocodiles, nesting birds and raptors, small mammals, blue bull deer, and of course, bears and elephants. He received his master's in biology at Northeastern University in Chicago, and Tom is a member of the IUCN Bear Expert Team. People who are unfamiliar with sloth bears are often surprised to learn a densely populated country like India can have bears. Can you speak to where sloth bears are found? Yeah, it's, it is interesting. Usually when I say I work with bears in India, people say, oh, I had no idea there were even bears in India. Sloth bears are actually found throughout the subcontinent, except for the high elevation areas. And they're also found in Sri Lanka and Nepal. And occasionally you might have one wander into a few areas of Bhutan, but 90% of their range actually occurs in India. Can you give us some of the interesting facts about sloth bears that people might not know? Sloth bears are somewhat of a specialist for a bear, although they're still Still a generalist, most bears are generalists by nature, except for the panda bear, which specializes in bamboo. But sloth bears, they actually, 50% of their diet is made up of ants and termites. The other 50% being made up of fruits and seeds. And occasionally they will scavenge on other animals as well, but that's relatively rare. So really, you know, half of their diet is insects and the other half is fruits and seeds. It's about it. Yeah, I've, I've heard the, uh, the great slurping noise when they eat at the Bear Rescue Center in, uh, in Agra. That's been fantastic. Can you tell us about that kind of characteristic with those lips and the muzzle that they've got that's so unique? Yes, paint? absolutely. In fact, that's a special adaptation of the soft bears to feed on termites. They basically use their long claws to dig into a termite mound, and then they use that sucking to basically feed on all the termites that are inside. Sloth bear is an interesting name. They're not related to sloths, and they're definitely not slow moving. How did they get the name? That's a great question. It's one that's come up multiple times. It's a terrible name. <laughs> Quite frankly, a lot of us who work with sloth bears would love, love to see it changed. Um, one of the versions has it that you had a naturalist who was traveling around the world with one of the early voyages. They had a stop in India. Then they had a stop in South America or vice versa. And when they got back to England, they had sloth bear skins and they also had three-toed sloth skins. It's not so much that they confused the two, but looking at the claws, as we all know, a three-toed sloth uses its claws to climb on trees and they have very long claws. Sloth bears have very long claws as well. And although they do climb, really their claws are made for digging. But as the story goes, they saw these very long claws and they were comparable to the sloth of South America. And so they came up with the name sloth bear. I don't know how accurate that story is, quite frankly. I've read that sloth bears kill more people than tigers. Is that true? That actually is true, but one thing you have to keep in mind when we say that is that sloth bears actually, their distribution is wider within India now. Obviously, tigers only occur for the most part in national parks, tiger parks that are protected, whereas sloth bears have a much larger range throughout India. So there are more sloth bears out there, which means there's potentially more attacks. Now, that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is that the sloth bear is an incredibly defensive mammal. Why is that? Well, basically, we believe it's because they evolved with tigers. This is an animal which is often has its head down and is digging in the dirt, looking for ants and termites or fruit or what have you. And 
if they feel threatened, their first instinct is to charge. And if you go onto YouTube or anywhere else, you'll see a plethora of videos which basically show conflicts between tigers and sloth bears. Now, tigers will obviously fight with anything, but what's interesting about sloth bears is they don't always lose these fights. In other words, don't get me wrong, in an all-out fight, a tiger will probably kill the bear every time. However, a tiger, again, we're dealing with wild animals. They need, they understand that if they're wounded, they're not going to the hospital, right? A wound which might heal in two weeks means they don't get food for two weeks and they might die. So the soft bear becomes a hard target for a tiger. They charge, they make noises, they use their those long claws they have to swipe and they use their teeth. They have very long canines to bite and they're just a very aggressive animal. They remind me a lot of badgers. I know a lot of people talk about honey badgers, which pound for pound might be one of the toughest animals in the world. Even American badgers, one of the toughest animals pound for pound. I would say sloth bears are reminiscent of those two species actually they are an incredibly tough animal pound for pound so they get right into the tiger's face and often the tiger says you know what this just isn't worth the trouble and they'll back off so they actually can live through these encounters there's one famous photographing sequence by Dickie Singh a friend of ours and where you see a mother bear she's got two cubs on her back she happens to wander into a male tiger courting a female tiger. First, the female tiger charges, and the mother with two cubs on her back charges the female, and she backs down. Then next, the bigger male comes. But same thing happens. That mother sloth bear gets right in the tiger's face, and he backs down, and she waddles off with her cubs to, to live another day. So what I'm saying is this aggressive tendency of soft bears does work. There's an evolutionary reason why they are so aggressive. Now, clearly in the modern age where we have people, right? People are everywhere. And when they run into people and when they're attacking people, simply because they're defensive, they are not predatorial. They don't eat people. But, you know, when they attack somebody, that person is going to be just as injured anyway. So it's a conservation area we're looking at trying to help mitigate is this this pension of theirs to attack people it doesn't go over well with people as you could imagine and really it's they're just being defensive they're just trying to get by and and they see a threat they want to take care of the threat before they run off so they attack a lot of people and unfortunately it's very unfortunate a lot of those people die not a high percentage but yes people die they have extremely long claws which rip and tear and this is an extremely tough animal so yes a lot of soft bears will run off right away but if if they feel the person is too close and they're at jeopardy if they run off first then their first idea is to charge and sometimes follow through on that charge and attack so it is uh, actually a bothersome, but it's an interesting conundrum we have trying to try to help solve that problem, to help the people. And then through helping people, we hope that'll help the conservation of this species. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've noticed the uh, intimidation factor that they like to do, even at the Agra Bear Center, that um, if you if you get too close to the to uh, their enclosures, boy, they will they will let you know in a hurry. And they are. Um, intimidating. Uh, That's right. Fantastic animals to watch, and and I'm also stunned that they're they're not as large as some of the bears I was used to in the United States um, growing up with, and seeing grizzlies and black bears and other things like that in the wild. Um, tell us about the the weight and just kind of the size of an average sloth bear. The average sloth bear is going to be around the size of uh, American black bear. Now, sloth bears are fuzzier. They have this big kind of overcoat. I mean, they're a very fuzzy bear. Um, so they can sometimes have the appearance of being a little larger than they actually are. This, of course, helps them when in a confrontation with a tiger where they want to look big. But uh, the coat also keeps them insulated from insects as well as heat. But they're not a large bear. They're much smaller than grizzly bears, but they're defensively much more aggress aggressive than a grizzly bear. Even though at the end of the day, really all they're trying to do is be peaceful and go away. But to your point, Dana, 
we have some great footage of a bear we rescued charging the fence when I was down in, at the Banner Goddess Center. And it, it's just a quick charge. You know, she saw me, didn't recognize me. But the noises she makes and just the sprinting, it's very intimidating. Yeah. And, and I think that also works with other animals, with tigers. You know, if you're, they're making noises, they're coming right directly at your face, it's very intimidating. So with that human-wildlife conflict, are there bears around uh, urban areas? Where is a lot of that happening, and how are people kind of running into them? Well, yes, sloth bears are able to live in somewhat degraded habitats. This is probably partly because half their diet is made up of ants and termites. This is useful when, you know, you're living in degraded habitat because termites and ants can pretty much persist in degraded habitats. So this allows sloth bears to live in areas relatively close to, say, agricultural areas. Also, sloth bears will raid crops as well on farmlands, and they'll go after orchards where there are fruit trees. They love to go after peanuts, for example, which are grown a lot in India. Many of the attacks are on farmers or people who are working the fields or they're working in these kind of boundary areas where it's not as if it's in a city, but it might not look as wild and yet you still have sloth bears there. Like places where tigers have long since disappeared, going back to our point earlier, you still have sloth bears that are hanging on in these areas. And of course, that's great from a conservation standpoint that these animals are able to hang on. But unfortunately, it does cause more attacks on humans simply because they're such a defensive animal. Yeah, boy, there's a lot of community education that can probably have a big impact in some of those areas. That's right. And in fact, um, there are several groups in India, including ours, which does a lot of outreach. Actually, right now, we're just finishing a film, a sloth bear safety film with the team in Indiana filmmaker, Thomas Rawl, we brought on to help us with making this film. And this film, the whole purpose of the film is to educate people about sloth bears and to give them hints on how to survive attacks or how to really how to avoid attacks, first of all. If you can avoid attack, you don't have to worry about how to survive the attack. So if you can avoid seeing bears, and, and many of those principles are the exact same principles that we use in America and Alaska, Canada with uh, brown bears. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the research that Wildlife SOS is doing with sloth bears. Um, let's start with the maternal denning studies. Tell us what you're trying to understand with these studies. Well, I'd start out by saying we've got a great group of biologists in India. Kartik, he has a ton of knowledge on this type of thing. Then we have Dr. Arun, who helps to lead the wildlife studies, and Swaminal, um, he is our lead field biologist in India. And then we also have several biologists working daily in the field. So we have a great group. And we started looking at the maternal denning of these animals and really the denning in general. One thing you need to understand is with a tropical bear like the sloth bear, they're not hibernating. So why are they still denning? Well, sloth bears still den, but they use dens very differently. Don't think of it as a seasonal thing. See it almost as a daily thing. And sloth bears have two types of dens. They have a resting den, which is used by any sloth bear um, to basically rest during the day. This is probably the most nocturnal of all bear species. So during the heat of the day, the bears like to hide away in some type of den. If they don't have a den, they'll hide under a bush or what have you, but they tend to sleep during the day hours. Then when the evening comes, they wake up and they go out to forage and do their business. The other type of den is what we call a maternal den. These are the dens that the females use to give birth and raise their cubs in. So these dens are obviously much harder to find because you only have a very specific type of animal looking for them, basically a, a pregnant female. Now, maternal dens can be naturally occurring caves, but in areas where they don't have naturally occurring caves, the females will dig out a burrow themselves, which they use to give birth and raise the cub for at least three months before moving on and moving out from that den which she had dug. We got involved in looking at both these types of dens 
in the eastern part of Karnataka on the Deccan Plateau. The Deccan Plateau is a very rocky, bouldery type of scrub jungle. And between these big habitat patches, you have basically a sea of farmlands. So you have people farming and then you have a big habitat, which is filled with bears and leopards and monkeys and that type of thing. And then more sea and then you come to the next habitat. So we started looking at, at how they're denning, where they're denning. And when we say where they're denning, we're looking at how close to the farmlands are they denning in? Are they close to the farms? Are they staying away from the farms? We're still doing a lot of analysis. But what is clear already is that in the areas that are very degraded, all the bears, the resting dens and maternal dens are much closer to the farmlands. And of course, this leads to more conflict. In the areas that are better protected, the bears are staying further away from humans. So what we're basically seeing is if, if the bear has an option to stay away from people, they're going to stay away from people. But often in these degraded habitats, they're forced into conflict because all the food and water is basically closer to the edges of their forest in the farmlands. We're still doing analysis and we're still trying to figure these things out. Another key thing we're finding is that you actually have some of the female bears giving birth in dens that are very close to the farmlands. In fact, on average, closer than the resting dens. And that we did not expect. Now, the reasons for this, we don't really know. People would say, what about infanticide? Are they trying to stay away from male bears? Like in brown bears, males will kill cubs. Well, that really doesn't happen with sloth bears. Uh, the males don't tend to go out and kill cubs. So it doesn't seem as if staying away from the male bears is as important as it is for, say, female brown bears. However, sloth bears, unlike brown bears, do have, even in our area where there aren't tigers anymore, there's still a lot of leopards and other large carnivores, which could be a threat, certainly to at least the cubs of a sloth bear. So perhaps the females are trying to stay away from predators. And then of course, the other possibility is they're simply trying to stay close to resources, food and water. The closer a mother is to food and water, this has been shown in brown bears in a couple of studies, uh, the higher the success she'll have in raising her cubs to adults. So there are several different factors and we're still running analysis. How do these behavior studies um, help us, the data from this, how does it help us protect the bears? In several different ways. One is that we know what the bear needs to survive. So in other words, in, in our study area, on the Deccan Plateau, what are, where are our problems with conservation? Well, one is bear attacks. Well, from this denning study, we're learning that the further, the more degraded a habitat is, the closer they're going to be to human habitation, so they're going to have more conflict. This is another reason to try to push the idea of fixing their old habitats, their natural habitats, so they don't have to come out of the forest to, to get food and water and thereby getting in conflict with humans. But another thing we're doing is we put camera traps on many of our maternal dens so that we have just hours and hours of footage of mothers and cubs. And from these, we're getting all kinds of other data, including when they're leaving their dens, at what time, during what seasons, um, how, the, how the cubs are growing, all kinds of different things. Your team is also investigating species overlap in Northeast India. Tell us a little bit more about that. What is species overlap? So this is a project that I'm actually working on with other IUCN um, bear biologists. Basically, there are three, I didn't mention this earlier, but there are actually four species of bear in India. So again, going back to, it's funny people say, oh, I didn't know there were any bears in India. The reality is we actually have four bears in India. And I think the only, only other country that has that is China a country of that size. So the bears we have in India include obviously your sloth bear, which is goes through the main part of the country. And then in the north, once you hit higher elevations, 
you get Asiatic black bears. And then you, slightly higher than that, you actually get brown bears. And that's Ursus arctos, different subspecies, but it's basically the same brown bear that we have in the United States and Canada. And then finally, if you go to the northeast corner of India, butting right up against Myanmar, you actually get sun bears. Sun bears are the smallest of all the bear species living today. So in that one little corner, you have sun bears. Now in that corner, you also have Asiatic black bears and you have sloth bears. This is probably one of the only places in the world where you have three species of bear that overlap. The only other place I can think of is Churchill, actually, in Canada, where you, during certain parts of the year, you might have polar bears, you could have a brown bear, and black bears, American black bears, are close by. That would be the only other place. I think there's one park in China which has three species, Asiatic black bear, panda, and brown bear, but those three don't overlap at all. So they're within the same park, but they're truly not overlapping. So in the Northeast, you have some very open parks, like a place like Kajaranga National Park, which is just loaded with sloth bears. And if you just go a little, a little outside the park, you get Asiatic black bears and sun bears. Now, we're curious about where they overlap because then you could piece apart their niches and see how they survive with each other. The truth is, Although we have places where you do have overlap with Asiatic black bear and sloth bear, we haven't found one spot yet. I'm not saying they're not there, but we've looked many places. We haven't found one place that actually has all three species that could overlap in the same forest patch. It could exist. We have some ideas that outside of Kajiranga National Park, they could overlap at least seasonally. For those who don't know, Kajiranga floods during the wet season and the sloth bears are somewhat forced a little into higher country just during the flooding. And that would put them in proximity to Asiatic black bears and sun bears. But we still don't have any proof that that actually occurs, but it would be very interesting to see if it did. And if, if that, likewise, if when the sloth bears move in, if the Asiatic black bears start to move out of that area. One thing that makes this very difficult is that these three species of bear actually look a lot alike, especially to someone who hasn't looked at thousands and thousands of photos like I have. And even if I were to see a glimpse of one, you might have a hard time telling. But for the normal person who just sees a bear, it's hard to tell. They're all black. They all have a a white band or uh, ring on their chest, it's quite difficult to tell the difference. And part of our work that we've done up there is to create some pamphlets and other educational materials so that people can tell the three apart. Now, we've been doing this also with camera traps. I mean, camera traps are just very useful for things like this. And we've been sent photos that are captured in these camera traps saying, what species is this? And we go through this exercise to make sure we all agree because, again, camera traps, you're often not getting that, that beautiful nat National Geographic photo of a bear. What you're getting is a, a blur of a bear and maybe you're only getting its back legs or maybe you're only getting, you know, its head. And it makes it very difficult. But after, I'm happy to say after going through thousands of photos, we finally have gotten to a point where I, I think we're way above 95% in accuracy in those. But it, it's, uh, it's been an interesting exercise. Um, and I think our hope is to find a place and to really delve into the niches of these three bears and what separates them. I'm also curious, I don't know if sloth bears and Asiatic black bears will even put up with each other. And my guess is if they don't put up with each other, the sloth bear being, it was probably the more aggressive of the two. Now, Asiatic black bears and sun bears are excellent tree climbers and they spend a lot of their time in trees. Sloth bears climb and they go up trees and get things, but sloth bears are not a good climber. I mean, there are many differences between the three species. Are there any other sloth bear studies you're working on that you want to tell us about? 
Well, we've just finished one publication on soft bear attacks for southern India. There's been several studies on this, and we're taking it a little further this time, and we're also trying to delve deeper and talk to other other authors of other studies, reaching out to them and trying to make a much bigger database so we can analyze soft bear attacks on a much higher level, really trying to get at the crux of helping people to avoid attacks or at least minimize damage from attacks. So the work on soft bear attacks goes on and probably will be going on for many years as we see that as a, a conservation issue. Also with Dr. Arun and Swaminathan, we are working on another paper on bears that are falling victim to human hazards. And when I say human hazards, what I'm speaking of is snares are a big problem. They're a problem throughout all of Southeast Asia, but they're a big problem in India as well, and certainly where we're working in Southern India. Wells is something we're looking at very hard. I don't know how many people are aware of how bad wells are, open wells we're speaking of now. Um, for bears and other wildlife. These wells are literally dot the countryside in, in India. And everything from, you know, soft bears to snakes to leopards to even I've heard of elephants falling in some of these wells. And the animals, if they don't die on their way down, they often are unable to get out and they die in these wells. So we're looking harder at these wells and we're talking about trying to find some solutions for them. It really is a huge problem. So we're looking at that really hard. And we're also looking at roadkill is a big one. We're looking at areas where bears have been hit crossing roads. And I was talking with the team today and we're looking at potentially wanting to build underpasses in certain areas because just like deer in the United States, you've all seen the deer signs as well as know what underpasses are and so that wildlife can cross either over a road or under a road. We'd like to do something like that in a few spots for soft bears because when you look at the data, it's kind of shocking when you see the same area showing up over and over again. And it's obvious, you know, when you look at these areas from Google Earth, and you can see, well, sure, the forest connects here. The animals are moving from this side to that side. It, it just makes perfect sense. But of course, humans don't take that into account when they're building new roads often. So hopefully we can do something about those areas. So we're looking hard at where the roadkill is happening. We're also looking at these devices. They're like little explosive devices, hand made explosive devices. These are a problem I've heard throughout much of Southeast Asia, but they're a problem in Southern India as well. And these are often put out by people who want to hunt, say, wild boar. And what happens is you, you hide these little devices in a piece of food and the animal bites down on it and it explodes. Well, unfortunately, this has been a problem for sloth bears. Um, in our area as well. We're trying to delve into this a lot further and hopefully we can start to push for something to be done about this. So I think that project which we've started on now, it has less to do with soft bear ecology, but these are all conservation problems. Our research, we we're doing it for conservation. We're, we're not doing it for the sake of research. This is all being done only in the hopes of helping to conserve this species or other species as well. Because quite frankly, these hazards, they're not just hurting bears again, you know, they're hurting leopards and deer and monkeys. And I, the, the list just goes on and on. It's Indiscriminate like snares. I mean, potentially insane. hurting children. I mean, people in the community. I mean, it's, it's a it's a terrible thing. That That's needs to be right. Addressed, so and thank you. Even the wells we were talking about, those are a human hazard as well. Sometimes they have a nice shelf to them, but sometimes they don't. If you're out walking at night in the wrong place, you could easily fall into one of these things. You've been working um, on sloth bears in India for years now. What are some of the most interesting things that you've learned that even as a seasoned biologist has, has surprised you about sloth bears? <laughs> Well, one thing I, I love, I, I just find it adorable, is 
is the way they carry their cubs around for the first seven to nine months of the cub's life. Now, you will see other bear species that have their cubs on their back occasionally, but not like sloth bears. Sloth bears, literally, the mom is just walking around with these two cubs clinging to her back. I've seen photos of her being in fights with tigers where the cubs are on her back. I've seen pictures where they're digging into termite mounds really deep down, and these cubs are just, you know, they're just buried in in mom's back fur. And I, I love that about these guys. One very interesting thing about that is other mammals that specialize in ants and termites, like anteaters, giant anteaters, say, they often carry their, their young on their backs as well. So that's very interesting. It's You wonder if that's a convergent evolution. Um, if there's something about their feeding pattern that lends itself to this. But I love that fact. And, and I'd be lying if I didn't say also, I love the fact that this is a tough animal. I do. I love the fact that, you know, they're, they're fighting off tigers often. Now, like I said, they're often killed by tigers as well. But this, this is not an animal which goes slowly into the night. I mean, they, they're there and they're an animal to be reckoned with. And I love that about them. I wish they weren't attacking people, obviously, but but I love the fact that these animals have evolved to take care of themselves and they do so in, in an aggressive manner in the wild. Yeah. If our listeners haven't seen uh, the footage of uh, tigers and sloth bears, especially the footage of Dickie Singh, I think is out there on YouTube, go go find it. It's, it's pretty amazing footage um, that somebody witnessed and actually captured something like that. My last question here. Um, Tom, it's a gorgeous spring day here in Salt Lake City, and um, I'm ready to get out and see some wildlife. What kind of tips do you have about possibly being in bear country and observing bears in their natural habitat for us in the United States? Yeah, it's something I love to do as well. I Every spring, I love to get out and go see grizzlies in Yellowstone, and I just love it. But I would say... The key things everybody should keep in mind always in bear country is one, when you see a bear, keep a healthy distance. I would also say if you're going into bear country, and I can't stress it enough, bring some bear spray with you. As long as you know how to use it, um, it's much safer. Actually, studies show it works better than guns for protection. And it's much better to be able to spray a bear in the face and have them run off rather than having to shoot them anyway. Um, so please like bring bear spray if you're going to be in bear country. And then also when you're camping, be responsible, be responsible with your food. Don't leave it all out so that the bears get habituated to human foods, because that's a real problem for both grizzlies and American black bears. Tom, thanks for the great discussion on bears and, uh, the good tips on seeing bears in the wild. If you would like to learn more about Wildlife SOS or give to support the rescue and long-term care of the elephants, bears, leopards, and other wildlife at our sanctuaries, please visit wildlifesos.org. We hope our new podcast series helps brighten your day and warm your hearts with the tremendous impact we can make together. Thanks for listening. <laughs>